Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. When you're there, say, mm hmm. Okay. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Say it. Let us go on. You might want to circle those. If you have a Bible you can't write in, it's probably time to get a different one. Let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance towards dead works and of faith. These are doctrines that we will look at in the future. Of the doctrines of baptisms. Circle the word doctrine and baptisms. The point there, it's plural. Do you see that? It's plural. Not laying again the doctrine of repentance. So we're doing a series here called Let Us Go On. And this is part one of Let Us Go On. And on the screen, you're seeing a young lady that we baptized last week named Melissa. And uh, we're saying her, she got baptized and she was a real blessing and she's excited, delighted, and do Melissa, we love you. And uh, I did a video preparing her for that baptism, and I basically wanted to just get to the meat of water baptism. There's so much to say about baptism and baptisms that you can confuse people. In the Bible, many times when people got saved, they baptized them right away. There's one group that probably were one or two hours after they got saved, they got baptized, repent, and be saved. Then, and nobody get offended, please. Then there are churches that once you confess Jesus, they have like a six-week series of teaching you on baptism. So we did not do that, Melissa. She's basically a disciple of Darlene here, and she was ready to get baptized. So we wasn't going to wait, and I didn't want to do let us go on to perfection for six weeks before we baptize her. So I basically gave the headlines. So if you look on my YouTube channel, you'll see a, a video called Water Baptism. This is basically a continuation of that. But we want to go a little deeper and it'll be turned into a series. You're going to want to watch these videos and share them with people that uh, you believe it will help. Somebody say, let us go on. In 1988, in a church I was pastoring, a young couple started coming. And... Uh, he was like a bump on a log. He was a young kid, and he would just sit there like Kathy is right now, and Darlene. <laughs> a Judge Judy will tell you, uncross your arms. And um, are you all cold? Okay. Are you comfortable? Can't have that. All right, so um, he would just sit there and stare a young fellow. And his grandmother was part of the ministry, and I said to him, I said to her one day, what is, what is it with him? And this is what she said. Oh, Pastor John, you have to understand that when he got saved, he had just such a glorious experience when Jesus came into his life that he's waiting for another experience like that. He was camping on his experience. Don't camp on the doctrine of repentance from dead world. You are saved now. Get water baptized. Get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Hello? Get off the pew because God's got something for you to do. Then there are those that have street ministry. 
Good, wonderful, go to the street. But they get the same person saved every Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> serious. You just promised them a slice of pizza, some money for some more booze, another room. They'll say whatever you want them to say. I want to say a change. And then I know of people that every time the preacher had an altar call and every time the, the, an evangelist, they got saved again. Now, I do not believe, no, here we go. I do not believe in one saved, always saved. I do believe you can lose your salvation. It's hard because once Jesus got you in the palm of his hand, he's going to do everything he can not to let you go. But if you pull hard enough, you can slip away like Saul did. And the scripture said it was as though he was never anointed. We don't want that to happen. So we're going on. From faith to faith, from grace to grace, to glory to glory, anointing to anointing, unto perfection. How many of you would say, there's still one area in your life that God's working on? You, none of you have gone on to, none of you have become perfect yet. One person, they raised two hands back there, and I wish you had three. <laughs> <laughs> Let us go on. So, when we baptize people, like we did with Melissa on that other video, we wasn't waiting to go on until she was perfect or knew this book completely until she got saved. Or, I'm sorry, to get baptized. She repented, and that was the requirement. Now, the baptism of John, the baptism, was different because this was before the Messiah. So John, let's look at that. Last time in that other video, we didn't show many scriptures at all because we, we just wanted to get to where we wanted to do for that particular service. But turn with me to Mark 1. Somebody say Mark 1. We are having fun in the Florida sun. I love Florida. I love a lot of places. But Florida is my home for many, many years. I was born in New Jersey. And then when I was a teenager, I went in the military. And uh, been in Florida for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. Are you in Mark 1? Verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger. Somebody might want to write this or circle these. Very important here. Before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice I get emotional when I see this. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That was the ministry of John the Baptist. To make ready a people for the coming of the Lord, John's baptism was before there was salvation because the Messiah hadn't come yet. Jesus hadn't rose from the dead yet, yeah. and he was preparing the people to meet thy God. Prepared to meet thy God. Confessing your sin, it was a baptism of repentance. What does repent mean? Turn around. You are going in the wrong direction. Turn around from going in your own way and your own will and your own desires and come to God. Confessing your sin. 
Now, when we leave people to the Lord, it's not just because you said a bad word or you thought a bad thing. There's 30 sins. Break the Ten Commandments in thought, word, or deed. And it will prove to you you cannot do it. That we need a Savior. And the only blood that was sufficient to not only cover, to blood our, our sins with the blood of Jesus. So this was before Jesus shed his blood. They were in the Old Testament, and John's baptism was a baptism of repentance encouraging people to turn, turn around. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went unto him of all the land of Judea and of Jerusalem, and they were all baptized. They're baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camels here, with a girdle of skin about his lines. He did eat locusts and wild honey. They thought he was weird. And once you get turned on for God, a whole lot of people think you're weird too. And you'll be facing wonderful persecution. Say hallelujah. You say, I tell people when we ordain them, you want my anointing? You're going to get my enemies too. And you want Jesus to come into your life? You're going to get his enemies too. But greater is he that is in you than he who is in this world. And preach saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me that latched whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and lose. And indeed, I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost. So people ask, do people who confess Jesus, uh, here's the requirement of baptism, that you are making a decision that you just don't want to go your own way no more. You want to go the way of the Lord. And that you realize that Jesus died. What should happen after somebody dies? You should just leave them there? Make a statue out of them? What? How many, what do you do with dead people? You bury them. That Jesus died and he was buried. But by the power of the Holy Ghost, he rose from the dead. Many people want the power of his resurrection, but they don't want to know the fellowship of his suffering. Apostle Paul said that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering. All right, we'll go a little bit further. Verse 7. And it came to pass, now by the way, John which is my name, thank you, Jesus, which my parents named me after my father's father, whose name was John. My middle name is Nicole. My name is Joan Nicole Fernando de Alessio. John was my one father, my grandfather, and Nicole was my other grandfather. Fernando was my father. So my name is Juan Nicole Fernando de Alessio. Alessio is my brother. He'll say something. He pronounces the last name different. It's more eloquent. In him. But John is a very special name. John means the grace of Jehovah. The grace of God. G-R, how do you spell it? G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. 
And as we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and welcome him into our heart, turn our life unto him, he gives you the grace to do what? Go on to perfection. Not to camp on your experience. But God has, wherever we are in our walk with God, it's not as good as it gets. The enemy wants to kick you when you're down and make you feel like it's never going to get any better. But I'm here to tell you that by the grace of God, the best is yet to come. God has more and more good things in store for all of us. So when we looked at the scripture, it said John was the forerunner. You might say he was the shadow. Jesus is the substance. Like we understand the feast of Israel. In Israel we observe, in Christ we interpret, and we apply it to our life. Figure, our lighting is so good here, I don't see shadows. Okay, you see my hand, can you see my shadow of my hand? You might not see it, you know why? It's behind my hand. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a shadow. So, did you ever hear somebody coming to the door and you look in under the door or so, or out the peak out, you see a shadow? The shadow means somebody else is coming. The shadow is not the real person. John was not the Messiah, but he was the shadow of the one to come to save all souls. Well, that, does that all make sense? Very simple. We shouldn't make the gospel, it's the simplicity of the gospel. We shouldn't make it so complicated that you have to be a theologian not to understand it. You know what I'm saying? It's just... Uh, 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 okay. We go on. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth, and Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized of John in the Jordan. Now, when I went to the Holy Land, they had a baptism service, and we baptized, we baptized, we had two busloads of people, and we baptized them there where the tourists go. They have a really nice thing, and there's a ramp, and you walk down, and there's real the hill on, and you put on these white robes, and we had two busloads of people, and we baptized them there in the Jordan. But, person that we knew there took us to the real place where Jesus was baptized. Very touching. Very, there's very, I got pictures of that actually. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw heaven open and the spirit, capital S, like a dove, descended upon him and a voice. Now, until this moment here, John did not know that Jesus was the Messiah. John said, why are you coming for me to baptize you? You should be baptizing me. And not because he knew then that Jesus was the Messiah, but because Jesus' lifestyle was so pure that John was saying you don't need to come to repent from your sins and Jesus explained to him why he needed to do it and if you ask three different preachers why Jesus said you'll have three different possibilities they will call it possibly this reason possibly that it's like the locusts people argue was it really a locust? Was it a big grasshopper that he was eating, like chicken wings or something? And others would say, it wasn't a real lo or a locust, it was a, a plant called locust, and they ate the roots, and others would say it was a fruit, type of a fruit. I take the Bible out at its word. <laughs> If we ate locusts, you figure out whether it was a plant or a fruit or a real locust, by the way, that they say with a lot of protein in it. So 
you know, they said he's weird, he looks weird, he dresses weird, and says strange things, and he eats strange things. I don't eat what a lot of you eat. I'm not going to go there. All right, here we go. And immediately the spirit will drive at him. Look at verse 12. You've got to see this. And immediately the spirit drive at him into the wilderness. Once you have this experience that you are now what we call born again, it's not just that I know that Jesus is God and the Son of the God. He was born of the Virgin Mary and he died on Good Friday and he rose from the dead on Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. It's not just that I know that. John was saying, prepare to meet thy God. Now I can say, I met my God. I heard people say they found Jesus. And I said, you didn't know where to look. Jesus found you. He wasn't lost. You know, I found him. He was like, Jesus wasn't lost. We were lost. We're the one who needed the Savior. Are you there? You all follow me? And where did the Spirit lead him? Into the wilderness. And maybe you'll feel like after you got saved that you're having a wilderness experience. You can't go there no more. You can't drink that no more. You can't do that no more. You can't hang around with them no more. Nobody wants to be you no more. And said, I got saved for this. That's where the apostolic anointing comes. Leading backsliders to come back to. That, that is the fun part of ministry. Not that you want people to backslide. You know, an evangelist will lead you to the Lord. Uh, a, a lot of times, the prophetic anointing, we don't even have an altar call. We just look and say, are you ready to give your heart? How, how'd you know? Today's the day of salvation. Are you prepared to meet thy God? But it takes an apostolic anointing to bring backsliders back to God. And that's the fun part. You know why? Once you bring them back to God, they're the best ones to use for serving and ministry. You know why? They found out there's nothing to go back to. They're not looking for love in all the wrong places. There's nothing to go back to. I met my Messiah. My Redeemer lives. And he lives in me and walks with me and talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. If I could sing, I would sing. What is that song and what does it sing? We are in the army of the Lord. Deliverance is our song and healing in our hands. We are in the army of the Lord. Now, it's not just to go to church and patty cake, patty cake, patty cake. It means you're in the army. This is war. There's a fight going on. We're recording this in 2021, and we just had an election. America is in a very good spot right now. Because a lot of people are going to find out why we told them not to vote that way. But having the eyes of the spirit and the eyes of understanding, as bad as it looks for America right now, with liberals having so much power and control and undoing every godly thing and turning it into unrighteous things, it's scary. America's in a very scary spot right now. But the way I see it spiritually, we're in better shape than we look like. I see so many flags. I see so many signs. I see so many bumper stickers that are still floating around and flying going on out there. 
I saw the crowds, you did too. And by what I see in the spirit, I can say this. We have a lot more conservative, capitalistic, patriotic, and biblical believers in America that it looks like. But what do we have right now? The liberals are in charge and they want late-term abortion, partial birth abortion. They want to legalize this, legalize that, and tax you to debt. Well now, preacher, don't you hear what they said? They're only going to tax the rich. Have any of you noticed the price of gas lately? You haven't seen anything yet. Now, I went up to Nova Scotia to preach, and gas was six ninety-five a gallon. Maybe you're not the rich that got that particular type of tax, but you're getting taxed. They just call it something different. Because actually, the, ta the, the decrease in gas prices was better than a lot of tax cuts. Because if your gas price is up a gallon, or $2, or $3, or $4 a gallon, and it's costing you $10, $20, $30 more to gas up your tank, and you get a gas it up two or three or more times a week, add that times four, and many people are now paying for gas two to $500 more a month than they were before, and they haven't seen anything yet. How do you know if somebody's a liberal? They have more compassion for the criminal than the victim, and I never will understand that. They seem to have more compassion for the raper than the one who got raped. For the, 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 the criminal, I never will understand that. Well, why would you put that in the middle of this? What was John's ministry? Prepare either way and make ready for the people for, for, to meet their God. And that's what ours should be because Jesus is coming. And he's not coming back as a meek little lamb. He's coming back as the Lion of Judah. Right now we are in a dispensation of grace. But there's a dispensation of judgment that's coming. And I want to make sure that I'm on the right side. How about you? Well, so far we're doing good because we haven't arrived, but we, what are we doing? Let us go on. We're not going to camp on experience. We know that God has more and better for us. All right, let's go to uh, another scripture that we'll also put on the screen, and that's Mark 16. Is anybody getting anything out of this? All right. Somebody say Mark 16. I'm glad I made the scene. Are you there? Verse 15, it's on the screen. And he said unto them, circle these words, go in, go in into all the world and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus came. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He died. He was buried. He rose. And he's coming back again. So when I have water baptism, I realize that ocean, or that river, that lake, that, that bathtub, it's a grave. And I identify with God, and I believe that. So what am I doing? I am God Jesus in my heart now, I'm dead. And when I come up out of that water, I'm leaving the old man down there, buried once and for all. For the sins that I did commit, committing or will commit because I have an advocate whose name is Jesus. That's a pretty good turner to have, isn't it? So when the accuser of the brethren comes before God and said, God, 
John did this, John said that, John did that. My advocate says, no, that's under the blood. Say, under the blood. Go ye therefore and baptize the every, uh, preach the gospel in, to every creature. Watch. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So when someone gives their heart to Jesus, we're going to baptize them as soon as we can, not wait till they know all this, because I don't know anybody that knows all this. Do you? How many we, we got a lot to learn? Yep. But we're going on. And the, how do you know they believe? Well, these signs follow them. Say this with me. Say, we don't follow signs. Signs follow us. And these signs shall follow them who? That believe it. In my name, they shall cast out devils. Do we cast out devils? Yes. We have left a lot of demons homeless. Watch out, they're running around looking for a house. And if they can't find one, they'll settle for a pig. We've cast devils out of horses and dogs. Do you think that's weird? <laughs> Try it. All right. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. I was preaching in some churches around Tennessee and Kentucky and that area, and nobody get offended by that. It's just a fact. And the pastors would say to me, uh, watch out for the burlap bags. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, we have a lot of these people here that they're going to test your faith. And when you're preaching, they'll run down an aisle with burlap bag full of snakes. And they'll throw it on the platform to see how much faith you have. Do-do, do-do, do-do. <laughs> the twilight zone. They shall take up serpents. Oh, yeah, I was watching for them bags, okay. You <laughs> believe I didn't close my eyes in that service. And if they drink or eat any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And these same people, a lot of them, they'll drink poison to prove their faith, that if they drink any deadly thing, that's not on them. I know of a town not too far from here where the people got in trouble. The pastor didn't because he was going to prove the faith and the power of the resurrection. That they were going to give him poison, poison to drink and on the third day, he would rise from the dead. Well, he didn't rise and the others went to jail. And that town is not too far from here. I'm going to edit it, the name of the town. So you have these, they're going to throw snakes on to see what your faith is. Others are going to drink something or ask you to drink it. And it reminded me when I was 15, 16 years old and got my motorcycle. I had a really nice motorcycle, and because some of you are Indian fans, I won't mention that was a Harley Davidson. But it was a nice Harley. Vroom, vroom, vroom. I was only 15 years old when I got it, paid cash for it with money that I earned. Uncle Joey wrecked it. He wanted to ride it. And before I could say it, he hopped on it, and I said, Uncle Joey, and my father said to him, Joe. And he said, I drive, he said, I operate big cranes. I could ride this little motorcycle. And he shot off, he took off, and went underneath a big truck, a, a truck for my business, and almost got his head cut off and smashed my fender. He paid to get it fixed. And not too long ago when we did Uncle Joey's funeral, 
After the service, a man came up to me and he said, I gotta ask you something. He said, I love Joe. He told me he crashed your motorcycle, is that true? I said, yes. And then the man said, he told me he bought you a new one, was that true? I said, he paid to get the fender fix. That, <laughs> that part, that part. He said, oh, I thought it would be something like that. He did, it was a beautiful bike, but I was crazy. Let me tell you what I would do. If you repeat this, I'll deny it and say you were confused. One, the snakes ain't gonna hurt me. Poison snakes, that poison drink. Do you know what I used to do? I used to stand up on the seat with my arms stretched out, going down the highway. I mean, I, 60, get up 60 miles, and then I would get up, and I would stand up on the seat of the motorcycle with my arms stretched out, and cars looking at you. I used to do that. And then I met Eddie and George. George had a wooden leg. He had one leg, he had a wooden leg. And I said to Eddie, how did George lose his leg? And Eddie said, he did something stupid. I says, what? He said, well, you know where Wildwood, New Jersey is? I said, yes. He got up and stood up on the seat of his motorcycle. <laughs> and the front wheel hit a stone. Bike went one way, George went the other way, and his leg went another way. I instantly gained wisdom. <laughs> I didn't stand up on the seat no more. So I was just a kid, 15, 16, when I had that bike, and 17, of course. And I came home one day, and my father said to me, you know, John, every time you go out with that motorcycle, your mother sits home and cries until you come back safe. Well, I didn't want her to feel that way, so I went over to her. This is all true, of course. My stories are not jokes, they're true things. And I said to her, I says, Mom, you don't have to worry when I go out with the motorcycle. I said, you know God will protect me. And you know what she said? You don't have to climb the Empire State Building to prove it. I never forgot that. She said, she said you don't have to climb, so I don't have to play with them snakes or drink that stuff to prove it. I have faith in God. Aren't you glad that your sins aren't covered in the blood? Aren't you glad that you are a new creation? The old man is dead and you rose up? Huh? Not only did you receive him as Lord and Savior, and now you're a new creation. You're no longer going your own way. You're going Yahweh. And now you know there's more. What's more? Baptisms. One came and baptized you with water, but another will come after me, and he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Point being this. If they don't speak in tongues, and if they don't cast out devils, and if they don't believe in healing and deliverance, do they really have the Holy Ghost? If they're really saved, they yes. Because when Jesus come in, as the spirit in their heart, they have the Holy Ghost. But many of them don't know they ought to go on to bigger and better things that it's available to them. Like there's Jaime back there. Well, let me not use him, let me use a real person. When I was a kid, and we're gonna wind this down and pick it up on let us go on, part two. This is part one. When I was a kid, a little Catholic altar boy, about 10 years old, me and two of my friends were walking up the hill to the new church that we built, and we were going to help the priest prepare for Sunday service. I believe it was a Saturday, and we we're gonna help the priest. And we're walking up the hill and one of the kids said, did you hear about Mr. So-and-so, a very wealthy man in town? 
What happened? He killed himself. It was in the newspaper. Well, it immediately got my attention because when I was at that age, I was told that if you took your life, if you killed yourself, you cannot go to purgatory, you pass purgatory, and you go straight to hell. So as a 10-year-old boy, I'm wondering, where did he go? Did he, did he go to hell? Did he go to purgatory? Did he go to heaven? I was thinking this. But the reason it made the headlines in the newspaper was because he was a very well-known person and the reason they said he killed himself was because of financial pressure. Have any of you ever been under financial pressure? And the enemy wants you to feel like it's never going to get any better? Did you ever feel like maybe I need to jump over a bridge, commit Harry Carey, maybe this is enough, I can't take it no more? Once you receive the Lord and you are baptized, your life don't belong to you no more. It belongs to God. And you cannot take, make that decision because you can't take it back. So it was in the headlines that Mr. So-and-so died and he killed himself because of financial pressure. So here's why it was in the headlines. Three days after he died, it was discovered he inherited a million dollars and he didn't know it. Now, that's when I was 10 years old. That's like maybe 10 years ago. Well, maybe 20. Okay, I repent. I wonder how much money that would be today. So here is Mr. So-and-so. He got a million dollars in the bank and he doesn't know it. So here's a lot of Christian. Let me say another song. I got the life of God in me. I got the life of God in me. Healing is available. Deliverance is available. Prosperity is available. Faith is available. But I don't believe in any of that. So you don't know you got it and you ain't using it, but it's available to all believers that would believe and these signs shall follow them that believe. I choose to believe. It's too late to tell me God don't save today. Mm. I was raised Catholic. When I was 15 years old, my friends invited me to, to, to go down the street. I was going to St. Matthew's Catholic Church. They invited me to a Tuesday night youth meeting. And I went every night and the teacher taught on God's plan for man. And on the last class, they asked those of you that want to receive Jesus. As, they, we went in the room, in the church, small little Episcopalian church, St. James. And we went in the room, and they were going to the youth meeting. Well, I went down and sat down in the pew. They kept going. And they went to a door to the side, and they were calling me. No, 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 that's the adult class. Come on, come on, come in here. This is the youth meeting. And they, I said, well, what is this? They said, it's an adult Bible study. I said, well, I'll be here. You go play basketball. So I stayed in the class, and the last class, they said, who wants to receive Jesus, Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Well, I'm a big shot. I could do that. Now they said, stand. Ooh. You want to stand in front of these people? I'm a little Italian cocky motorcycle boy. I stood. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And then I felt the peace of God. I was 15, and the teacher robbed that joy for a minute. It was a lady that night. Oh, God can use women. Oh, you don't believe God can use women? And she said to me, now, John, it's up to you to get the rest of your family saved. I said, how can I do that? I cannot tell them I was here. I would get excommunicated, pass purgatory, go straight to hell. I wasn't allowed to go to a different kind of church. Well, the teacher said that. So one day I got up the nerve to talk to my mother. 
I said, it's a true story. I said, Mom, I have to confess I visited another church. You did? What happened? I said, Mom, I got saved. And she said, saved from what? And I knew I wasn't completely saved yet. <laughs> I knew I had to go on to the next step. But I did lead it to the Lord. I led my father to the Lord and my sister to the Lord. And on my mother and father's 50th wedding anniversary, my father wanted me to do the service and offer communion. We had about 150 people there. And I saw the majority of my family confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, some of them are still camping on experience and they have not gone on, but the seed was planted. The seed, we sowed that seed. And some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Well, we never got to this message we wanted to preach today. But here we are. Did you enjoy this? I did too. Well, this is, let us go on part one. And I can't wait to get to part two. But it's a little late. And we had, did you enjoy the food we had? We had some good food. Now, it's Judy's birthday. Judy's been in the part of this ministry since 1991, was it a three? Two? Two. And here she is. She never went on. She's still as ornery as she was then. <laughs> but she's a devil slayer, tongue talking, casting. Man. Every time I go to a, a store or a restaurant or have a waitress as ornery, I think of Judy. And I said, that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's friend, you know. Maybe who knows what happened. I'll close with this story. Ah. You guys make me mushy. I couldn't find my makeup, so I'm safe right now. But uh, I think my good daughter, she keeps taking my makeup. And <laughs> so I have three empty bottles. I tried to get some out with a Q-tip and there was nothing in there. But we got the empty bottles. And um, she'll wait till I refill them, $16 a pop. And um, this man, think about this. You know, every time I go to a toll booth, and there's an old lady there collecting it. And now they don't even do that no more. They just ping, and money disappears out of your bank account. Ping. Man, the price we pay for tolls. And, uh, or a waitress or something, I always think, that could be my mother. I always think about that. Could have been my mother. I have to, have to do that job or whatever. Well, a man went to a drive through and uh, the girl, this is a true story, she was not very pleasant. And he said to her, how are you doing? And something kind. And she wouldn't even respond. I had this experience in the same franchise of that restaurant. And uh, that was before the, the virus. And I went to the register, and the ladies were standing there, people. And I said to the lady, I said, uh, have a good day. And she looked at me like she wanted to kill me. I said, I just want you to have a nice day. And she said, I had other plans. I, I said, well, whoop de doo according to your faith, be it done to you. Well, this man went through a drive through and he said to the girl, hello, how you doing? She wanted to smile. She wanted to make eye contact. She wanted nothing. So he went up to the next where you get the food. And he said to the lady up there, hmm. she was, oh, he said, I will see the manager. And the lady said, can I help you? He said, you know that girl up there? She got a real attitude. And you know what the manager said? Yeah, you never know what somebody's going through. 
Think about that. Next time somebody has an attitude, they might not know what they're going through. Well, wow, you're making me mushy. Well, we have to get the message next week. Um, watch the video about baptism. It's called Water Baptism Plus. We baptize Melissa. Then this is called Let Us Go On, part one, and the next, one of the next videos we'll do will be called Let Us Go On, part two. You're going to love it. Very exciting message. And uh, I'm prepared. We did not prepare this message yesterday, although I went over my notes and everything. It was prepared 42 years ago <laughs> in preparation because that's how long we've been doing this. Going from faith to faith and nation to nation, fulfilling the Great Commission, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Oh, I want to say so much more, but we're out of time. All right, share this with somebody that you believe that will help. Stay connected. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on Facebook. And be a partner with this ministry. This is good ground. This is good ground. It's a good ministry to support. And we're going to continue to teach messages like things to consider before you vote. Freedom from the Jezebel influence. Freedom from the Python spirit. Teaching faith and healing and deliverance. Basically, Apostle Paul said, I am confident of this one thing, that I will come to you with the fullness of the blessings of the gospel. And that's my desire. Because that's what will change people's lives. That they'll know the truth and the truth will make them free. All right. I wish we had more time, but we got to go. Thank you. Say amen. Happy birthday, Judy.